Tuesday. Before we name ourselves and introduce ourselves, I want to name this place and acknowledge our position and privilege on the traditional lands of the Beatuk and the present day lands of the Mi'kmaq, the Innu and the Inuit. Now a land acknowledgement recognizes a much longer history reaching beyond colonization and the history of the European colonies and it upholds the significance of all Indigenous peoples who live and continue to live in this place we call Canada. In the days and weeks and months ahead I will invite you all, we have so many opportunities to move forward with reflection and action and reconciliation and we have so much work to do as we seek to heal with hearts and minds together. Welcome to Teach Your Tales on Tuesday. My name is Jan Bewley, and I've lost track of how many of these we've hosted. I think this is number seven. I'm very fortunate to offer classes in literacy and drama education in Munn's Faculty of Education. And I'm delighted to have you joining me tonight, all of you who are watching these, this wonderful program. We're reflecting on 100 years of teacher education in Newfoundland and Labrador, where we've been, where we presently are, and where we hope to grow. And tonight I have with me four incredible guests and they're going to introduce themselves. I'm going to call on them just now to say a few words about where they are in Newfoundland and Labrador and a little bit about themselves and then we'll get on with some, some stories and some, some sharing. So I'm going to ask Brenda Gatherall if you can unmute there, Brenda, and you can keep your, your, uh, your microphone on. Go ahead, Brenda, and tell us where you are and, and where you teach. Hi everyone, I'm here in St. John's and I teach at St. Bonaventure's College uh, on Bonaventure Avenue and this is my 21st year at that school and uh, so we're an independent Jesuit school and uh, I'm the music specialist for grades K through 6. Great, well welcome, welcome Brenda and Wendy Marsh, tell us a little bit about you, you stepped on mute there Wendy. Yes, Enjoy. perfect. Thanks, Jan. It's an honor to be here tonight. And uh, so I'm I'm in uh, Labrador. I live in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. But uh, I came to uh, Labrador for a three month stint back in 1994 for three months. And here I am 28, not 28 years later. So uh, I guess the first half of my career, my first vehicle was a uh, single cylinder players. And I used that on the north coast of Labrador in McCovic in Maine, whereby, whereby I was a uh, classroom teacher, a reading recovery teacher and an IRT. And then in 2007, I traded in my, my Skidoo for my first vehicle back in 2007. And I've been here at the school board office uh, as a program specialist for English language arts K to six, and now a program specialist for um, for reading with the EAP, with, with the EAP schools, which is all of them technically. So yeah, I've been here in Labrador most, more than half of my life right now and, and honored to be here and working with the fine people in, uh, in both uh, my profession and, and personally. So it's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. And, and wonderful to have you here, Wendy. And, and if anybody's wondering that poster that we put out to ad advertise Teacher Tales on Tuesday, Wendy's wearing one of her favorite pastimes is, uh, is bicycling, biking. And you do like rough trail biking, right? <laughs> it's not like I do on the little Elizabeth Avenue and around the Avalon. This is hardcore bicycling you do. So the helmet, I loved it. I loved it. Shows the real side of a teacher because we don't live at school. I'm going to ask Sister Alice Walsh, a real privilege to have you here with us tonight. Alice, if you could just tell us a little bit, where where do you live and where have we found you tonight? <laughs> Jan, my, I'm so grateful that you invited me to be on the panel. And uh, my, my name is Sister Alice Walsh. I'm a retired teacher. I was also a principal for a number of years and I did my administrative courses from Mon. Right on. At the present time, I'm retired and enjoying my retirement. And here, I... here at the Presentation Mother House, I'm living with a community of retired teachers in St. John's, Newfoundland. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. And at the ripe age of 93, the wisest of the wise, we have you with us tonight, Sister Alice. What a thrill. And there's somebody connected to Sister Alice Walsh, who I'm going to call on. Laura Barr, can you say a few words about you? 
Sure. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm Laura Barr. I am Sister Alice's great niece. Um, and I am following in her footsteps. So I'm currently living in Kings Point in central Newfoundland. And I teach at a K-12 school here in the community, uh, Valmont Academy. I teach the grade six, seven class, the majority of their courses, as well as core French and music in the school. And it is wonderful considering it's my first year out. Yeah. And I think, mm. Laura, I think I saw something on Twitter where you're doing Wordle with your kids and they're, they're champions of the game. Oh, I wonder yeah. if, I wonder if they're watching tonight. Are they watching this lovely thing? I, I imagine some of them are. They're, no they're, idea. I'm sure I'll hear tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, welcome all. Um, I'm going to leap in here and I've got some questions for each of you. And I will also keep an eye on the clock. We really will finish up at 8.45 at quarter to nine tonight. But I, I'd like to start with a question for Sister Alice. I wonder if you could think back to your beginnings as a teacher, Alice, and just tell us a little bit about what drew you to the teaching profession. Well, Jan, um, I was fortunate in my school days to have teachers that I really liked the teachers. I liked her teaching. One one uh, teacher in particular was a, she was an excellent teacher. She she captivated our interest and she kept really kept us on on our toes. So I I really liked that. Then um, I, I I was I'm I was thirty thirty seven years in teaching. Wow. And most of these years too were well half and half. I was half. Um, classroom teacher and then they appointed me principal and I was all over the island. I was in St. John's Corner, Brook and Gander, Trapassi for Centre and Harbour Breton. Oh, wow. <laughs> and and Alice, have you got teachers in your family? Was your mom a teacher? Yeah, yeah no, but my I had two sisters a teacher. Uh -huh. and, and my sister Kathleen and my sister Bernice, they were teachers. Wow. And my mom was a, she she was a homemaker. But a teacher, a teacher as well, teaching you yeah. how to make bread and all those things that I've heard she about. Taught us, she taught us so many values of, of being good to the poor. And right. you know, it was really so. Then when I entered the convent in 48, uh, I entered into the uh, congregation of teachers. Right. That, that was our mission of teachers. And, and we were very fortunate that uh, uh, the founders of the Presentation Sisters was Nan O'Negan from Ireland. And right. she spent, spent her life teaching the poor. So yeah. I was in, in the real world of teaching and I loved every minute of it. Yeah. I loved the children, I loved the teenagers and, and things you know, we learned by our mistakes and, and you know, it was a tremendous experience. I, I Beautiful. Love. And you've been, you've been immersed in that teaching profession for a long time. Let's go over to uh, Brenda Gatherall. Take us back to, you can, you don't have to tell the truth tonight, Brenda, you know, you can <laughs> leave people wondering. Um, what are your early memories of being pulled into the teaching profession, my friend? I, I remember having a poster in grade one, and it was, you know, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I wanted to be a teacher. And I've always, uh, I, I don't know, I was, I just loved working with kids. I'm an only child. And so I think that was part of it. Like I loved working with little ones when I was, when I was younger, cause I didn't have anybody at home to, uh -huh. to, you know, play and hang out with. And, um, so yeah, I remember filling out that little poster and I had to cut out a picture of, you know, something you wanted to be when you grew up. So I wanted to be a teacher. <laughs> great. Great. And Laura, how about you? What, what pulled you into the profession? Very similar to Brenda. I was an only child and I liked playing teacher as a child. And I think it was my grade one page in my 12 years of school book that mom still has somewhere in our house. It says, when I get older, I want to be, and I have a teacher written there. Um, and then when I was 10, 11, 12, I started helping out with dance classes, started teaching my own dance classes. Right. Uh, and it just kind of happened. I did a Bachelor of Arts with the hopes of doing speech pathology and realized the medical field wasn't really where I wanted to head. Um, and now I'm here. <laughs> and and I would say, Laura, knowing you as I do, as a lifelong learner, you've got another piece that you could announce tonight that you're jumping into. What are you heading into? 
Yeah, I just got my acceptance for my Master of Education in Literacy at Mount St. Vincent University to start in September. And how incredible. Wow. Yeah. Oh, Very wow. Excited. And and Wendy, how about you? What pulled you into the profession? Um, I guess back in the day, um, relatives would have said, I'm either going to be a teacher or a lawyer. And so uh, clearly I became the, the teacher. And I, much like other stories that have been shared here tonight, uh, I do think back to some of my high school teachers, uh, you know, my high school drama teacher, whereby I was involved in the high school musicals and my mother would come to the Arts and Culture Center and, and, and watch those shows. But really it was the teachers with whom uh, I was working with back in the time, uh, back in the day, and they reached out to us as students and we saw them as people before we saw them as teachers. So they had that connection and that social, emotional, the relationship side of things. And so, um, that's uh, that was part and parcel some of the reason but then when i went to university in ottawa back in 88 uh, i did become a girl guide leader uh, i volunteered in some schools just down the road from where i was living at the time and so that certainly encouraged me and i did enjoy you know working with the young ones and uh, really uh, uh wanted to be, be a part of the learning because learning never stops so um that was um some of the main reasons but then when i think about uh this past fall whereby I got storm state in Maine for three or four days. I taught in Maine for 12 or 13 years. I did get storm state for three or four days because when weather does come down, it comes down. Um, but I felt like a bit of a celebrity because everyone was like, hi, Miss Marsh, hi, Miss Marsh. And it wasn't Wendy. It was still hi, Miss Marsh, right? And so I was, these are people that I would have taught back in grade one in the mid-90s and that now have children of their own. And so when I go into the classrooms, I'm like, if I taught your mom, I think I taught your dad. I guess I know who you're all about. So um, yeah, so it's really kind of come full circle for me in the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, that's beautiful. I can remember when I first met a student I had in grade three, I taught grade three for 25 years. And when I first met a student who then had gone on and got married and had a baby, and I felt pretty ancient, actually. <laughs> I thought, hmm. I am old, I'm getting older. Um, I'm gonna give you a minute to think about this and it's okay if you can't pinpoint a particular student, but I want you to go back in your mind. Laura, not so long for you, you've been out there a year, but there might be a student, there might be a learner that you met. I'm going to ask you to pinpoint a student you taught who maybe did something that you continue to think about today. Maybe it was a student who taught you something about patience or taught you something about yourself. You can use that student's first name. Maybe it was something funny that happened. It might have been a lesson you were teaching or a student who maybe still you wonder about where did they go? Yeah. And I'm going to begin with Brenda. Is there a student, Brenda, that you can pinpoint? <laughs> there is. There was a little boy, um, and uh, he was, I think he was in kindergarten. Brenda, and, are you able to come any closer to your yeah. your microphone there? Sure. Oh, that's much better. Yeah. Right. Turn up my volume. We don't want to miss your story. There was a little boy I taught, and uh, he was in grade uh, kindergarten at the time. And um, he was very impulsive and very, you know, just of the moment and uh, such a sweet little boy though really kind and just honestly you know just a very honest person and of course being the music teacher I'd only see him maybe three times a week but every time he'd, he'd leave class and he'd look at me and he would say Miss Gatherall tomorrow's a new day right and I'd say yes oh. absolutely and so that that is always a lesson with working with little ones that you know um you know, he knew that he, you know, wouldn't raise his hand or he would constantly blurt out things or whatever. And you just have to remind him and run. And he'd say, Miss, tomorrow's a new day, isn't it? And I'd say, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> that was his catchphrase. And I say that with all, like, I say that to my friend who I've worked with for a really long time. And it's sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a reminder about him because we often wonder what happened to him. Yeah. I'm going to jump in here with a story. I don't often contribute to the storytelling, but I remember a little girl, I'll, I'll say her name was Bridget. She was born with um, a hand with this finger like that. She was missing the top part of her, her finger, the entire part of that index finger. And she uh, 
often brought Del Monte fruit cups. You know those things with the pull top, Alice? Do you know what I mean? They're, it's like a fruit cup with a pull top mm -hmm. on it. And she always had to come to a friend. She wasn't able to get her third finger. It was tricky when you were eight. And she couldn't really pull it off as easily as she wanted to. And um, I don't know what prompted me to say this to her, but I said, you know, Bridget, maybe we could write to the Del Monte Fruit Cup Company and, and tell them that not all kids are able to open up that container as well as they might think. So she did. She wrote to the Del Monte Company. It was in Toronto at that time. And my goodness, a letter arrived to Bridget and she opened it up and they happened to be coming to Halifax for uh, some kind of a conference. The, the, the chief executive officer of the company was coming and he would like to pay a visit to the school. And so I'll say his name was Mr. Scott. He arrived with another person from the company and he just wanted to congratulate Bridget on bringing to their attention the fact that this one size fits all opener didn't really work for everybody. He consulted her at eight and said, what would you like to, to have? And she just told him that he could make the loop even bigger for her third finger or her thumb to go in and make it easier to pull. And do you know that that caused the packaging of Del Monte fruit cups to change, that they're much easier to open now. And I like to think that that kid brought about that change. Isn't that a cool story? I just thought of it as I was thinking of the stories you were going to tell. Alice, I'm going to go to you next. Is there a child that you continue to think about, Alice? Yes. When I was in Cornerbrook, I, I, I taught grade two. Mm -hmm. I had a wonderful group of students. They were kind of the upper class. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were really, really actively involved in activities. But there was one young fellow by the name of Michael. He uh, was continuously almost lying down on his desk. And I used to say, Michael, would you kindly sit up straight, please? But he still went down. So I uh, his father was a medical doctor. Oh, and I said, Michael, when you go home, would you get your father to examine your back to see if you have a problem? <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, that afternoon, didn't the doctor come back with Michael and rapped on my door? And here was when I opened the door, I got such a fright. See the doctor with Michael, I thought I, this is one time I'm going to be fired for sure. But anyway, he said to ask. Uh, so, uh, at that time, my name was Sister Felicita, oh. and uh, he said, that Sister Felicita, uh, my, there's nothing wrong with Michael's back, but, um, you know, if you were a little bit more strict with him, uh, he would sit up straight. Oh. And I said, oh, gee, thanks for the suggestion, doctor, because uh, maybe I, I do have good order in this classroom, and most of them are really, really good, but it's, it's the problem of Michael almost falling asleep. I don't know if it's because of my teaching or whatever. So, so anyway, I said, doctor, thank you very much. So I'll certainly think about what you said and, and I'll be a little bit more stern with Michael. <laughs> so as, as I continue to teach the class, Michael still was inclined to bend over. I said, Michael, would you kindly sit up straight, please? If you want good grades in your class, I said, you just sit up straight and pay attention. And uh, after that, there was no problem. And I didn't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. I, and, and don't you wonder where Michael is now? I do. He, yeah. he, he became a lawyer. Oh. And then he became a judge. Wow. Uh, but, you know, he, he passed away at a very early age. Oh, oh. But, you know, I did learn a good lesson from that experience uh -huh. to be a little bit firmer with Michael, but uh, it, and it did work and he <laughs> did pay attention and he was a scholar. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you for that. And Laura, if you could share your story. So for me, it's a little different where I've only been out for not even a year yet. Uh -huh. um, but for me, a memorable, I've had mem many memorable moments this year so far. Um, but one big one is 
recently I've heard a lot of, you know, students aren't doing a lot in the classroom. There's not a lot happening, especially with the pandemic and kids being in and out. Um, but my class, I've never met a more motivated group of students. Uh, They're grade six, grade seven, and we have an outdoor hockey rink at the school, just behind the school, and they love wow. it. Wow. They really want a Zamboni oh. because the ice isn't completely flat. So I said, why don't we write a letter to the town? So as a class, we wrote our letter and oh. the students had their voices. I was just doing the typing. Yeah. The town replied and said, you host a winter classic. We will do what we can. So we, as a class, the grade sixes and sevens are planning a winter classic for hopefully a two weeks from now. Wow. And it's all in the hands of them. I'm just helping to facilitate. Wow. You know, wow. so for a first year, I think that's a pretty big memorable moment and they can do anything. The power you know? of an idea, right? The power of an idea. Yeah. Wendy, up to you. What's a, what's a child that you're recalling? I will go back to my name days and uh, this little uh, child in particular, his name was Bradley and I can still picture him. Um, so I was a, a reading teacher for a number of years and also a grade one teacher and uh, certainly as we know as primary teachers, uh, language arts and reading is, you know, and writing is very much an important part of the curriculum. Yeah. So this particular um, incident was whereby um, uh, this particular grade one child uh, was having some um, challenges taking on, the, taking mm -hmm. on the, the task of reading. And so I guess we had spent uh, a fair bit of time trying to help him with that, right? Um, and so I guess one particular lesson we had, and I can still think that I can still feel it within me. I guess it was a it was a it was a bit of a struggle, and perhaps I was pushing too hard, and he was trying his best. Um, and as he left the classroom that day, uh, as he left my my setting, he said, um, "You know, thank you for reading with me today." Uh -huh. And I can still think about that because I think he may have sensed the the anxiety in the lesson, and maybe the frustration, and my trying to make it work for him and him trying his best and so on but when he turned around and said you know thank you for reading with me today Ms. Marsh you know that really struck a chord with me so um I think when I what I took from that and what I continue to take from that is certainly you know that anxiety in any learning situation is not beneficial um it's not uh, it's not the best thing because really it's just going to lead to a more internal anxiety yeah. Um, and then, you know, really working from, and I can think back to my reading recovery days here and my own days as a, as a, as a, as a language teacher in my grade one classroom, you know, working on children's strengths uh, versus their deficits type thing, really looking at what they can do versus uh, what they can't do. And, um, you know, knowing the, the child, keeping the learner at the center and knowing the culture of the, the child. And one thing that really... Um, from where they come from, sorry. And one thing that really stands out to me is to is to teach the child as a, as a reader as opposed to teaching reading and pushing curriculum. You know, so we really have to keep all those things in mind as we're working with our students. But I'll, that's one thing that really stood with me and it, it broke my heart when it happened. So it was a bit of a wake up call for me. And I was really semi early into my career. But you know, as someone alluded to in, here on the call, um, you know, we do make mistakes along the way. And um, that's, that's fine because we learn from those mistakes. So, yeah. you know, it's very much a, teaching is very much a learning journey. Yeah. Oh, Wendy, what a beautiful story. And, and, you know, I think about um, what children teach us, right? I once had a kid say to me, Mrs. B, I think I've told you this story, Laura, do you like teaching math? And I was pretty open. I always said they can ask me anything. And I said, sure, I like, I like teaching math. And he said to me, because you don't always look like it. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, <laughs> it was a really wonderful teaching moment, right? I need to look like I love it because it, it wasn't my favorite subject to teach. But boy, what a, what a wonderful teaching from a young, a young child. So I want you to think about teachers that are coming into the profession now. And uh, this is a funny question to ask you, Laura, because you're one year in, but you still have wonderful advice. And I, I wonder if, if there are three things, just take a moment to think about what those, or two or two things or three things that you would 
want a young teacher who's just starting out to really think about what's what's most important and you can share i i don't want to limit you but let's say two or three ideas there so i'm going to start with you brenda what things come to i mind? would say um your friendships and it's the friendships you make with other teachers but it's also the friendships you make with your students those mm. relationships are really important so it's important to keep those um, in check and um, and and just like um, Wendy mentioned about you know having that moment with that child reading you know like it's yeah. not all about getting this curriculum outcome covered today or you know whatever it's it's about having a good day in the classroom and having yeah. fun um, I, so I would say definitely relationships and friendships for sure and uh also building a community in your classroom or in your school and and whatever whatever that means you know working together um i would also say supporting each other and i would also say um just making it exciting for kids every day is a new day and brenda having seen you in action i think you embody all of those things you're you're just a magnetic music teacher i think so Alice, I'm going to go to you next. What do you think is most important in in advice for, for teachers? What do they need to know? I think that number one is um, lessons that are well planned and well communicated to the to the younger younger teachers mm -hmm. and also to the younger pupils. I think that having in mind the individual differences of each child. Yeah. And uh, especially the slow learners who find it difficult sometimes to answer questions. And I think that having um, consideration and empathy and also compassion uh, for these children who may have difficulty in furthering their education. Right. right. And I think too that, uh, you know, having a kind of a a community feeling among the teachers in the staff room and I think that that feeling could be a, a major way of communicating the same concept to the children uh, uh -huh. with love and with understanding and above all with patience. Right, right. Oh, that's beautiful, Alice. Anything else? Well, in, in teaching, uh, we're, we're bound to make mistakes at times. And I remember um, when I was teaching grade seven, uh, and I remember this young girl, when I went back to the classroom, I was teaching, I was a principal, but I had to teach, I taught classes. And when I went back to the classroom, this little girl was showing signs of stress and strain. And I said, Peggy, what's wrong? And she said, Sister Alice, uh, the grade seven has called me Miss Know-It-All. Oh. And I said, Peggy, uh, you know, I think we can learn something from that, but you are a very good student and you answer the questions very well. So I think we will give the grade sevens a chance to answer a question. Uh -huh. So, and, and, I, and also, maybe they would improve on their homework and answer questions, which we, the next, the next class, I conducted the question and answer period and um, they uh, uh, they were not as good as Peggy but I made no comparison I said you know you're doing your best but there's, there's such a thing as doing better uh -huh. and so I think it was a learning experience for me and also for the class that uh -huh. is so important to respect each other no matter how much ability we have to learn but anyway that was a very challenging uh, question and, and experience for me as a teacher beautiful alice there's no way you're 93 i'm just looking at the screen there's just you're just uh, i'm i'm in awe see jan I you, see when i was teaching you weren't even born i know no one here was born when i was teaching <laughs> no one <laughs> you are amazing you are truly an inspiration laura how about you what's what's some advice for new teachers who've been out there for me, the biggest one is it's okay to learn alongside the students, mm -hmm. because especially with the kind of placement I'm in this year, I'm teaching a little bit of everything. 
So my first class with all of them, I said, I'm new. I don't know everything. And there have been classes where a student will say, Miss, what's this? So we all look it up because I can't answer that question. And when they see those moments, they realize that you aren't a teacher, you're a human being. And I have found that those walls being broken down have really helped me with my relationships with the kids. Mm. Um, and it, it really has, like someone has said, turned it into a friendship. Mm. And I mean, there's still that teacher student relationship, but they know also know that my door is open no matter what they need. Um, so I, I think just making sure they know that you're a human being really, um, is at the root of it. Um, a great example for this after school today. So it was twin day. I didn't have my glasses on because I was being a twin with a teacher who doesn't wear glasses. And at the end of the day, one of our students, her mom works at the school and she said, miss, where are your glasses? So I said, oh, I have my contacts in today. So she needed me down on my hands and knees so that she could see in my eyes to see what contacts look like. Uh, she asked me if I could take them out. So we went to a mirror, we took them out and she was amazed. Yeah. But it was that moment of, I'm not her teacher, I'm a person. Uh -huh. And it wasn't something that I was sitting her down in class to teach. It was something that she was just learning that in 20 years, she might remember. That's beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. And jumping on that teachable moment right then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's neat. Wendy, how about you? What advice would you give to some new teachers coming your way? Uh, oh my, and that's that's a good point you've raised there, Jan. Because uh, I uh, I uh, we really appreciate teachers who come to Labrador and, and stay for a period of time, right? right? Because there, there tends to be a bit of transition here, um, turnover, I should say. But I guess if I could think from it from two lenses, um, I think back to my uh, first year in Macaulay back in 1994, whereby I was the only teacher in the school uh, because most of the other teachers had been more senior in their career, like. Uh, on the weekends, I mean, on the, on the weekend. So okay. I was the really, I was the, sorry, I was a really junior um, yeah. a teacher there. And on weekends, I'd be up there by myself and all the other senior teachers, tenured would be, you know, home doing their thing. So I did find it a bit isolating to that point. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really as the internet was just kind of getting on the go, if that makes sense. So that was 25, 26, 27, 28 years ago. So I did find it a bit isolating. So, you know, to that point, what I'd say is, you know, certainly to, if you're starting out as a new teacher or if any advice could be put out there is to, you know, to reach out to others because learning is very social and teaching is very social. So, you know, surrounding yourself um, uh, with others who, who are positive because the odd time we do have a, a negative soul potentially creep in, but to really surround yourself uh, with, with positive people because that will uh, certainly help uh, through the whole process of sorts. And then if you think about it, you know, and the whole notion of like a professional learning community, none of us is smarter than all of us put together so you know when we come collectively together then you know that's where we can move mountains so to speak but to kind of echo on that laura's comments there if we really think about it you know learning alongside the learner and if we think about it from almost like a, a play based in the primary grade to an inquiry based in elementary and um, that will go much further in terms of engagement as opposed to you know, maybe what I was exposed to when I was growing up through X number of worksheets and so on. Um, getting to know your learner, as I said earlier, you know, the interest surveys, but the big thing that does stand out for me here is again, uh, the, the learner at the, set, at the center that we've been really promoting with a lot of people that we work with. Uh, so not only knowing them from a cognitive standpoint, but where they, what, what, the, what the background is, what the interests are, and how we can kind of use that and utilize that in terms of moving their education along because really you can find the child in the curriculum as opposed to really pushing the curriculum without knowing the learner so yeah. really that's what we've been really pushing and i think that does make a difference in terms of the engagement aspect of uh, of teaching so you know there's lots of things to do uh, to um to suggest Dan, but those are just a few things that kind of stand out to me as i reflect on my x number of years of teaching here in, in the, the big lands wise words <laughs> The learner's lead. I like that. I really like that, Wendy. Um, I'd like you to think about what happens when the times got tough in teaching and reflect on what was that moment. It could either be a, a really hard moment, maybe a very poignant moment, or a really joyous time. What, what memories do you have 
I, I remember teaching at a school in Stratford and there was a very tragic house fire and a little boy in our school died in that fire. But in that tragedy, the school came together and comforted. There were five kids in that family and this little guy who had been home with mom um, died in this fire and the school got together and we delivered meals for a month to this family and they were farming. It was a farming family and it was really, it was heart wrenching. It was really heart wrenching. I had his brother in my class and um, that's a memory that sticks with me certainly from a very poignant perspective but a, a really good teaching moment in that tragedy as well about the importance of um, cloaking. It's that comforting thing, Brenda, that you've talked about. You've all talked about the importance of supporting each other. So uh, um, a moment that stands out, a, a, point, a part in a day maybe that is your favorite, your favorite part of a school day maybe. Um, and uh, I'll, so I'll start with you, Laura. What's what's your favorite moment or a poignant moment that has happened so far? Not exactly related to the school day, um, but our boys volleyball team, it was a senior high team, so it was grade 7 to 12, yeah. had to travel to Portobasque in December just before everything started kind of tightening. Wow. And they needed a teacher sponsor. So... They came up and they asked me. I know nothing about volleyball. Can't uh -huh. play. Can't do a thing. So I said, sure. So myself and a coach who's one of our primary students' fathers, um, and the 12 boys hit the road in a bus and went over to Port of Basque for the weekend. Uh -huh. And just seeing, spending time with those kids, many of which I don't teach because I don't teach the high school students here. Uh, or four hours there, four hours back, and a night, two nights in a hotel, and seeing them as human beings outside of school mm -hmm. was the best, most memorable moment that I would have never imagined having yeah. this year, yeah. um, to the point that I heard about all of the stories many of which I wouldn't even mention somewhere here like this, but the relations that relationships that were created between myself and those students in that time um, are some that I don't think will ever disappear to the point that there's been a couple who have been asking, you know, are you coming back next year? We need a French teacher. Can you come oh. back next year? And I mean, I'll apply for the position, but there's no guarantee. Um, but to know that, you know, a weekend with a couple students, in a hotel for a volleyball tournament when you spend time with them can do that and yeah. get them interested in something they may not have been interested in yeah is mm -hmm. just amazing and see you in a new light pretty cool that they asked you to be the chaperone there yeah or... it was a good time <laughs> wendy how about you is there a joyous or a poignant moment that sticks out for you even in a day a, a favorite part of the day there is actually. Um, I attribute a lot of my, I guess, uh, my own learning through my reading recovery background. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pretty um, intense course, I'll call it, for a year. And then I, I was a reading recovery teacher for five or six years thereafter. But mm -hmm. I really did enjoy working with uh, the little ones, grade, the grade ones at the time, you know, uh, uh, in, you know, supporting them in the reading and to unlock that, you know, reading journey for them. But, you know, I really enjoyed some of the stories. Um, just some of the anecdotes that children would say to me, just as an example, I could share a lot, but I'll, I'll, I'll pick a, a one or two. The, this, this little guy was trying to write the word bus, right? He was trying to write the word bus. And I kept saying the word bus. And I said, bus. And he said, bus. And I said, bus again. And and uh, I said, you know, what do you hear? And he said, miss, I hear the engines. <laughs> <laughs> So I, um, there are many stories like that. I'm actually now working in my program specialist role with a, a young child. A similar story. He loves the outdoors. He comes to school. I was over to this school back in the fall, 
and this school, school is kind of it's it's down the road it's it's a it's a one room schoolhouse we'll call it four youngsters and one principal and the little guy in grade two came he loves the outdoors he came with a snare okay so that afternoon we went outside out, outside all of us and we he showed me how to set that snare and then we came in and we wrote about it because that's what they that's what he enjoys and so the story then followed you know so we were, you know i i set the snare out in the woods with miss marsh or whatever and he came to the word snare he's in grade two he didn't really know how to spell that word so i said you know what would you expect to see at the beginning of the word snare and he said a rabbit <laughs> right so <laughs> i mean it makes sense he heard, you know, what would you expect to see at the beginning of the snare? I said, what letter would you expect to uh -huh. see at the beginning of snare? Anyway, it's those stories, Jan, that I still think about and chuckle. Yeah. You know, we've had many stories through the years, and those are just a couple that stand out to me. And to see the, ch the children embrace and take on that task of reading, because what I do find is when the children have that, then their confidence soars and other aspects of the curriculum. And I've seen that many, many times. But if we can have fun alongside of that with some of those little stories and, and things yeah. that happen, then it brings the toughest to your day. It's beautiful. Oh, those are great stories. Brenda, how about you? Anything from your heart? <laughs> there was, uh, well, as the music teacher, we always do these, you know, Christmas concerts. Like a Whoops, Christmas your, play. Your, your sound isn't quite there, okay. Brenda. All right, so at Christmas time, we'd always do yeah. Christmas musicals or Christmas plays with the kids. And there was one year um, I picked a play and the, the story was, oh, you know, goodness. Santa, it was a problem on Christmas Eve and Santa right. you know, his delivery or whatever of the presents and they had to solve it. So anyway, the kid who was playing Santa, um, you know, was so creative. And so, you know, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, he's going to be the perfect Santa Claus. So yeah. I asked kids to pick out three characters that they'd like to be in the play. And, uh, you know, we'd, you know, get them to read for us or whatever. And so anyway, he ended up becoming Santa in the play. But about two days before the Christmas play, he came to me and he was so upset at lunchtime. And he just said, I don't know if I can do this. And I said, oh, but you know, you worked so hard and you sound amazing. You know, I've done so many run-throughs. And, and anyway, so uh, I was genuinely concerned for the Christmas play. I wasn't sure if he was going to pull it off. But the night of the concert, uh, my mom and dad uh, went to the show. And uh, they said it was the best five dollars they had ever spent in their life. <laughs> it was like, you know, this guy just came to life and came, you know, into himself on the stage. It was so incredible. That's so great. I love moments like that. That when you when you realize, like, oh, you know, there's still little doubts in there, no matter how much you encourage. That's and, right. But you know, you help them work through it, and you support them, and you get the other kids to encourage, and you know, and you just want them to be successful. Yeah. Anyway. And who knows where they go i mean somebody taught margaret atwood in grade three right right i always think about that somebody taught Lawrence olivier in grade one he was in somebody's kindergarten class and and look at these incredible people now alice how about you what stands out for you as a, a, a... i can i can make i can recall that when i was principal in saint john's at the at, at presentation school uh, we went to Lab. I went to Lab City with the basketball team. Uh -huh. We had the coach and the assistant coach, and I went with them. So wow. while we were there, we uh, they played well. As a matter of fact, they they won by one point. <laughs> and the and the um, students there at the basketball, on the, they said, you know, imagine those those students from St. John's with three coaches. <laughs> I was not a coach. I was a spectator. And then we invite, invited them down to St. John's and we sponsored them and they played, they played in our gym. Wow. And it, it, they win by one point. Beautiful. So it was and, there. Uh, I mean, the, the experience of friendship and it was really beautiful. I mean, something that I, I don't think I'll ever forget because it, it was kind of challenging, but very good experience. Now, how, how would you have traveled to Labrador City with a group of kids? Flew. How did you get there? You flew there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow, it'd be an expensive trip. Yes, uh, it was, but, you know, we had a good PTA. Yeah. And they certainly uh, 
helped us out tremendously. They sold and a few. They sold a few cookies. You well, know, we had a few card games and all the other projects that you need to make money with them. And it worked out really well, and it did create, as a matter of fact, I met one of, one of the students who's now retired, was working here at the mother house. Wow. And, uh, and she uh, came over to me and she said, Sister Alice, you were my principal, you know, and I said, really, dear, you know, I'm getting up in years now, I don't know about that. But however, she said, I remember, I remember the basketball <laughs> game. She said, we had a wonderful time. And see, they remember that. Yeah. Yes. They remembered a good time. Yes. I remember a child um, whose daddy was a pig farmer, and we were reading Charlotte's Web, and I asked the principal, and he said, sure, just don't let it go anywhere that shouldn't. We're going to need to get a cage for it. Some bales of hay. I had a, a custodian who was an absolute saint who said, It's okay, I'll bring a tarp. If the if the pig goes to the bathroom, it'll go on the it'll go on the tarp. But it goes to memories. And I ran into that, that um, I actually went to her wedding. And she said to me, I still remember the baby Wilbur that we had in our room when we read Charlotte's Web. So those, those memories. We have uh, come to the end of our time. I'm, I'm a, a fiend for watching the, the clock up here on my computer. And uh, I want to thank all of you, Brenda and Laura and Wendy and Alice for filling the airwaves tonight with these marvelous stories. It's been wonderful to have you. Um, our next Teacher Tales on Tuesday is on March 29th, which is the last Tuesday in that month. Um, I want to, to thank especially um, some people on the sidelines, Morris Berry and Craig Adams, who look after so much of the technology, and to Lisa Charlong, who helped with the poster distribution and getting all of that to happen. This has been true joy. Right above my desk here in my home office, I have a, a sign that says nothing without joy. And I, I think about that guiding me all the time in, in my teaching and learning. Thank you for being here. I will say good night to all of you and keep up the wonderful work. I'm excited about all that you do and, and Alice, all that you teach the world at 93. Thanks everybody for being here. Good night. Thank you. Bye. And thank you, sister. Thank you, sister Helen, for helping on the <laughs> sideline. Come on on the screen, sister Helen, so we can see you. You oh, were really? amazing. You were amazing helping out there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank if you I need a, if I need a, if I need a technician, you're my pick. <laughs> if you need another teacher, you can have me there too. <laughs> Bye. 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 Good night, all. Thanks.